Ned Kalange. I'm the President and CEO of the Colorado Trust. I want to welcome you to the first Health Equity Learning Series presentation of the 2018-2019 season. I couldn't tell you how thrilled we are all be, we're all to be here this evening. At the Colorado Trust, we believe that all Coloradans should have fair and equal opportunities to live healthy, productive lives regardless of race, ethnicity, income, or where we live, or other differences that affect opportunity. I want to set some context for tonight's speaker and look backward to 1932, when the United States Public Health Service and the Tuskegee Institute began a study on 399 African American men to examine the natural progression of syphilis. What this translated to was the misleading and lying to these men, and without their consent, not informing them about their diagnosis and not treating them, including when the cure, penicillin, became widely available in 1947. The study was originally planned for a half year. It was continued for 40 years, not ending until the early 70s. It took another quarter of a century for an American president to acknowledge and apologize for what occurred. I'm sure that many of you, if not all of you, have heard this story before. <clears throat> it stands out as a well-known symbol of medical racism. But our speaker this evening, Harriet Washington, has researched and written extensively, and it points out that Tuskegee is just one of numerous of examples of people of color being abused, marginalized, and discriminated against in the United States healthcare system. This racially motivated behavior in healthcare is something Harriet refers to as medical apartheid. I will let her give you a more extensive and better definition. And before we get started, I just want to add a few notes. We will email you an evaluation survey after tonight's presentation, so please keep an eye out for it. We read all these responses, and they're vital to helping us plan and improve our Health Equity Learning Series events in the future. Materials will be posted on our website after the presentation today, including the slide set from our presenter and a complete video from tonight's event. Please note the video may take a few weeks to get up on the website and the written materials get up a little quicker. The video will be available with Spanish subtitles as well. <clears throat> I would uh, respectfully request that you silence your cell phones if you haven't done so already. Thank you. I want to acknowledge our 20 grantees for the 2018-2019 Health Equity Learning Series. Today's event is being recorded, and these organizations will be hosting viewings of the recording in their communities across Colorado. The presentation viewings will all be accompanied by professionally facilitated discussions, and I want to give a shout out to Transformative Alliances, who is our consultant and partner in this area. Thanks. Uh, I, didn't, I know Nicole's here too, but I was looking at right at Dara. Uh, <clears throat> I also want to highlight the six grantee organizations whose names are bolded on the slide. These grantees comprise the inaugural class of our community leaders in health equity track. In addition to hosting viewing parties or viewing events, these organizations are taking place in an intensive 18-month curriculum focused on health equity education, and awareness. This significant time commitment, and I applaud and thank those who are dedicating the, their effort and energy to be part of it. If you'd like to find a viewing event near you, please visit the Health Equity Learning Series page on our website. There's an interactive map that will locate the grantee in, the, in Colorado closest to you, along with their contact information. And the events will begin taking place around the state in a couple of weeks. Now, I'm really excited to introduce to you Harriet A. Washington, our speaker this evening. She is a science writer, editor, and ethicist who has been a research fellow in medical ethics at Harvard Medical School, a visiting fellow at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, a visiting scholar at DePaul University College of Law, and a senior research scholar at the National Center for Bioethics at Tuskegee University. Ms. Washington has also held fellowships at Stanford University she holds a degree in English from the University of Rochester and a master's in journalism from Columbia University. In 2016, she was elected as a fellow of the New York Academy of Medicine, and she teaches bioethics at Columbia University. 
She's written several books, including Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present, which you have, many of you have in front of you this evening. This won a National Book Critics Circle Award and the Penn Oakland Award and the American Library Association Black Caucus Nonfiction Award. She's also written for numerous science publications and journals, and I hope you will help me in welcoming Harriet Washington up to the table here. Good evening. It's such a pleasure to be here with you, um, although the subject of my talk is not very pleasurable. I wanted to just make a few notes before I begin speaking, and that is that I wanted to warn you that um, I'm going to have a lot of slides here, not all of which I'm going to get to. I'm sure of that. So my strategy is that I'll show you each slide, but if I don't linger, if I go on to the next one without discussing it, feel free to ask a question afterwards in the Q&A so we can address it. Um, I've just been talking with one of my new friends about the parallels between what happened in Nazi Germany under National Socialism and what happened in this country. What I find especially disturbing is that it was American prosecutors and American physicians who went to Nuremberg to confront the Nazi architects of the Holocaust and accused them of betraying medicine by using it as a cover for genocidal torture of Jews and other people with whom they disagreed. But these same doctors, some of them, like Dr. Andrew Ivey, were doing the same thing to black people here in the United States at the same time they confronted the Nazis. And that actually is one of the more um, persistent uh, traits of this kind of abuse. What's, what, you, what I really want to convey to you is that despite the fact that we have been revered to, um, raised to revere doctors and scientists for good reason, most of them are wonderful people, brilliant people, but I think we have fallen into an intellectual trap where we think that science and history are disciplines that cannot be criticized. We think of scientists and physicians as doing good, and often they are. But the fact is, science and history is only as good as the people who practice it. And when you have humans who are biased practicing science and medicine and history, you're going to end up with biased history and biased science. Medicine has a lot of biases. Medicine has entire mythologies that have been constructed. And their end effect is to demonize and harm people of color. This is something that is not a product of an individual bias or an, you know, an occasional um, miscreant. This is something that is in, inbred. It's bred into the fabric of American medicine itself. In the same way that enslavement was part of the fabric, as, as Michelle Obama called it, the birth defect of the American nation. We had the same situation with medical science, where from the beginning, there were reasons why African Americans and other people of color were demonized by scientists and medical people, and the mythologies have unfortunately not abated. They're still with us. Structural racism, a lot of definitions, but I'm using it to allude to the, the way in which medicine itself, and scientific philosophy itself, has been co-opted in order to promulgate racist mentalities that are still with us. As I talk about the abuse of the past, I'm often going to link to a parallel abuse of the present to illustrate this. And medical people are not um, especially venal, especially evil. Medical people are Americans. And they reflect, medicine has reflected society, the larger society. So when we had enslavement as the law in this country, medical enslavement was permitted. When de jure or legal separation by race, segregation was the law in this country, we had medical segregation. And today, when disparate access still governs many, many aspects of American life, from education to employment, we still have um, disparate access in medicine. So medic medicine and science have been subsumed under American culture. They are part of American culture, and they have their own culture of mythology and bias, which is harmful to people of color. And ultimately, it's harmful to all of us, because we're medically interdependent. Despite the fact that the African Americans have been singled out and treated especially poorly, this doesn't augur well for anybody's health in this country. Uh, nobody can be, um, avail himself of the bounty of the American healthcare system until everyone can. 
This slide, there'll be a quiz later, no, I'm only kidding. This slide is only to show you that there are 15 chapters of the book, which means there were at least 15 separate areas of American medicine in which I was able to show a long and profound history of medicalized abuse of African Americans. So it's not a matter of a syphilis study or children in one study or one study of reproductive technology. It's a matter of every aspect of American medicine being infected by this bias and by, this, by these harms. And believe me, I had other chapters that did not end up in the book, so I could have written more. So, when we talk about the history of race and research, unfortunately, a lot of this history has been written out of the history books. A lot of this history has been hidden from us. And so, it's sometimes hard to understand or believe that things could have happened, but I've included some advertisements that appeared in newspapers to show you how common and how open was the abuse of African Americans. Basically, doctors would advertise slave owners, bring me your sick slaves, bring me your useless slaves, too old to work, I'll put them to good use, I'm gonna use them in research. These were ads that ran in the, in the regular newspapers everybody read. That's how common it was and that's how accepted it was. And I don't know how many of you have heard of this, but I'm actually very proud of this. I'm heartened by this development. Um, in New York City, within the last month, the statue of James Marion Sims, a surgeon of the Victorian era, was toppled, taken down, and moved out of Central Park. This is a result of my publicizing um, the true nature of his work. In 2007, when medical apartheid came out, I wrote about the fact that James Marion Sims had been praised as the father of American gynecology, as a selfless, you know, savior of women, but really what he had done was he had used enslaved black women who he locked in a shack on his property and repeatedly subjected them to painful, distressingly intimate vaginal surgeries as experiments to see if he could find a way of correcting a condition called vesicle vaginal fistula. He wanted to correct it because he knew it would make his fame and fortune if he were able to cure this. And he did find a way of, of correcting it, and he immediately left New York, went to Paris, I'm sorry, he immediately left Alabama, went to Paris and then to New York, and basically ruled the Academy of Medicine. And this statue was had across from the Academy of Medicine until last month. When, um, when my work publicized the fact that his image was a myth, and the statue was a beautiful lie about who he was, the medical students in the audience jumped up and said, we ought to tear that statue down. I said, if you do that, don't use my name. I'm already in enough trouble, you know? <laughs> but of course, they, did not, they could not tear, tear the statue down. But for 10 years, medical students and the women of color who lived in this neighborhood fought City Hall, insisting a statue be taken down. And finally, the city agreed. The statue was taken down and removed. And that's heartening to me because it shows that um, people can accept that these mythologies are false and demand that they be eradicated. Not everybody, of course, but enough. And I've already explained to you what vesicle vaginal fistula. It basically was a horrible complication of childbirth in which the tissues of a woman's um, reproductive um, genitalia fell apart and she was left incontinent, you know. So there are openings between her rectum and vagina and um, it was a horrible situation. Uh, it condemned a white woman to a, base, a social death. You read Victorian novels, or sometimes they'll, they'll allude to some poor woman who has to live in the attic, can't come out into, into company. That woman often had vesicle vaginal fistula. But it affected more slave women than white women. Why? Dr. Sims told, explained to us why. He said slave women were dirty and sexually profligate, and that's why they had it. But he was wrong. This, was con this condition was actually created by enslavement. Malnutrition, including vitamin D deficiency, caused bone problems, including a flat rachitic pelvis, a pelvis too small to admit the baby's head, leading to long, protracted, long, difficult labor, and ending up with the baby dead and the women's tissues falling away from her body. That's what caused it. Also, black women were made to have children three years earlier than white women. Why did I say made to? Because they were forced. Having children by enslaved women multiplied a slave owner's wealth. They wanted their slave women to have children. In fact, Thomas Jefferson wrote in Notes of the State of Virginia, he wrote, 
I consider a slave woman who gives birth every two years as profitable as a best worker on the farm. So slave, um, slave women were encouraged to have children early and often. And when they didn't comply, they were forced. But instead of admitting that these girls, which is what many of them were, were being forced to have sex with their owners and with anyone the owner designated and forced into pregnancy at an early age. Instead, doctors said, well, the reason why all these slave women are have giving birth to these mulatto babies is they're Jezebels. They're sexually promiscuous women. They're whores, basically. And there are a lot of medical journals testifying to the fact that slave women were actively pursuing their masters and forcing them into inappropriate sexual relationships. It's laughable at this point because we know better. But at that time, it was believed. These were doctors promulgating this. This was their theory that slave women were genitals. And not only black women, Native American women were considered the same way. Um, Native American women, in their own naturally alien societies, they often had a great deal of power. They certainly decided who they would marry and have children with. But that changed as whites took over and soon in the medical journals, you see the same dialogue about Native American women. Well, these are cheap women. These are whorish women. They're, uh, they will have sex with anybody. Of course, this was also a cover for rape. These women were being raped with impunity. And um, so this is something that we find over and over again. People of color being blamed for their own problems, their own medical problems. And rape and abuse being portrayed as um, something very different, beneficence. And what's happening today? This is a very good example of how yesterday's mythologies play into today's abuses. Look at Native American women who are the most, like, most frequently raped people in this country. And more than that, when women are raped on a reservation, there is literally no legal recourse. The law actually forbids the reservation um, councils from persecuting non-Native people from, um, for rape. So if you have a First Nations woman who's been raped or sexually abused, the law actually states that if it has been done by a man who is not part of the nation, that there can be no legal, re legal remedy pursued by her. So this is basically, we, we have laws in this country today that permit their rape and assault, which is why they are so vulnerable and why they're so often assaulted. So one big part of our medical mythology that we have to do away with is our medical heroes. Who do we decide our medical heroes are? I have a very small pantheon here of people who we decided are medical heroes. These are people whose statues you can find. You go to medical schools, you find their portraits, you find um, documents written in honor of them. Even today, these are people who are praised as being these great benefactors of medicine. But all of them have predicated their success on the savage abuse of African-American bodies. I can't, there's no time to go through all of them, but Talia Farrell Clark, Raymond Vondelier, John Heller, Thomas Perrin, and Oliver Wenger. They all had something very important in common. Anybody know what it was? These are medical heroes. They were also officers of the public health service, public health service officers. What did they do? These are the men who constructed and perpetrated the Tuskegee syphilis study. Thomas Perrin became Surgeon General. And when he became Surgeon General, he was asked, um, he said, I'm going to make my mission the eradication of syphilis. We're going to find a cure on my watch. Now, during that time, that was like Surgeon General today saying, I'm going to find a cure for AIDS. And few people believed he could do it, but indeed, it happened on his watch. Penicillin was found to cure um, syphilis, uh, to prevent syphilis, and now we, could, we didn't have to deal with um, <coughs> tuberculosis any, I'm sorry, syphilis any longer. So, but when Thomas Perrin was approached and, and he was asked, listen, we have all these black men in the Tuskegee study. Are we gonna give syphilis to them and cure them? He said, no. The opportunity represented by these men will never come again. We have to keep them infected. So we refuse to cure them, we refuse to treat them. And that is actually the Achilles heel of all these men. All these men, perhaps they did the things that they're praised for, maybe they did not, but all of them abuse African Americans in order to attain their goal, and yet we call them medical heroes. The problem is in how we define our medical heroes. We tend to define it by an achievement, real or imagined,
but we don't look at how they made that achievement. We don't care if they abuse people or certain people. We don't care if they cut ethical corners, if they did things that were wrong in order to, to get their cure. We focus on what they supposedly did, and that's a mistake. And that mistake really costs us in terms of not understanding people's bestial behavior because we've called them medical hero. So science is considered something that is um, above reproach. People will say, you can't argue with that, it's science. Science is pure. Science doesn't have any um, emotion attached to it, doesn't have any opinion attached to it. It's a fact. These facts constitute science. Unfortunately, that's not true. Because you have science as it's idealized. That's the ideal of science. The way it's practiced is it's practiced by human beings. Human beings who have flaws and limitations and make mistakes and who embrace mythology. When you look at how the races were first characterized, this was considered, this was a science of its day. During the time races were first characterized, you had groups of prominent scientists telling us who African Americans were, who First Nations people were, um, who Asians were. But was it really scientific? No. There was a lot of bias that pre predated any kind of research. They already had preconceived notions about who these people were. They merely used science to justify these preconceived notions. We're not talking about collecting data and coming to a conclusion. We're talking about taking a bias and an opinion and then clothing it with science. So during the time that African Americans were first brought to this country to work, um, this um, animal breeding was also being um, studied by scientists. The science of animal breeding um, focused very heavily on classification of animals. And they used the same theories, the same frameworks and technologies to classify people. Now, the interesting thing is that when European scientists classified people, they did not look at differences and consider, well, there's a difference here, a difference there. We don't know if it's innate or caused by something in the way they live, but there's a... No, they looked at hierarchies. What they, what they were focused on was establishing who was at the top and who was at the bottom. And that's what they did. Now, interestingly, before the science um, was first promulgated, the hierarchy was Europeans at the top, followed by Asians, a little debate there, but then followed by other um, light-skinned people of color. And Africans always fell to the bottom, and the, and the residents of the southern tip of Africa were always at the very bottom. Various offensive names were given to them, pygmies, hottentots, etc. But whatever they called them, they were always at the bottom. Now, unsurprisingly, when scientists address the hierarchies, guess what? The exact same categorization existed. You still had Europeans and other light-skinned um, people of color, notably Asians, some Asians, at the top, and Africans at the bottom. And by the way, Africans and African Americans were essentially considered the same people by the scientists. They had some basis for this because until, um, I don't know, 1850 or so, many, if not most, African American slaves were still Africans. They were people who had been born in Africa. So they did not distinguish between Africans and African Americans. And um, we, they had this mythology about who's at the top and who's at the bottom. They used their idea of science to buttress it. And this science, was not only biased, but it also supported some very important things in the Southern culture. It was in the South where the African and African Americans lived. And in the South, um, enslavement and scientific assessment of slaves' characters were um, in support, they supported the slave system. One of the ways they supported the slave system was providing free labor. The Victorian era, was filled with scientists who also said that they were Christians. If you're a Christian and a Victorian gen gentleman and a scientist, how do you justify taking people, kidnapping them from their homeland, forcing them to labor, raping the women, forcing the children, your children now, by these women, into enslavement, beating them, using them for medical research? How, you can't justify that, can you? But you can justify doing this to people who are not really people. And that's exactly what the scientists of that era said. They said that 
these Africans and African Americans are not really, they're not, they don't fit into Homo sapiens. They're not part of our species. They're a lower form of, of life. And um, having established that, they went on to say that they differ from white people in every way possible. Now, one of the things I often heard at the beginning of when my book first came out was they said, people would say, you say that slave owners beat and abused African Americans and failed to treat them medically. And they wouldn't do that. These are their workers. They wanted them to be healthy. They needed them to be able to work, you know? Those are two different things. Being healthy and able to work are two different things. And that's something that was at odds with Western healing philosophy. The Western, Western healing philosophy was based on the dyad, physician-patient dyad. Two people, the physician and the patient. The, patient, the physician had a sense of, love, of care and responsibility for the patient. I'm going to care for you, I'm going to make sure that you're healthy, I'm going to do everything necessary to keep you alive. And the patient had unending trust in the doctor. A beautiful relationship, but it did not apply to African Americans. With African Americans, it was not the slave but his owner who decided if he would get treatment, what kind of treatment he would get, whether he'd get an abortion, uh, whether she'd get an abortion, whether he'd have an amputation, whether he would get malaria treatment. Only the owner decided that. The owner would decide whether to call in the doctor or not. Also, when the doctor treated the patient, treated the slave, it was the owner who had to be satisfied. The owner had to be happy at the end. The doctor had done his job well. No one cared what the enslaved person thought. No one cared what the enslaved person felt, whether the enslaved person had wanted the treatment, quote unquote, or whether the enslaved person felt satisfied with what had been done with him. That was not part of the equation. So they had a dyad between the physician and the slave owner, what the enslaved person left outside and unconsulted, a non-person. Um, so this myth, of treatment of slaves is just that. They were not being treated. They were being maintained in a state fit for work. It's important to note that there are many diseases that are compatible with being able to work. You can be mentally ill, you can be profoundly depressed, you can be ridden with parasites. I could go on and on, and sometimes have. <laughs> but the reality is that these were not patients, okay? These were entities. It was the um, slave owner who had the care and concern of the physician. Also, there are economic issues. As time went by, Africans who had brought their own brand of medicine with them um, in midwifery, but also surgical treatment. You know, Africans were responsible for a lot of our health innovations, um, but they were not acknowledged in history books and medical books. So, for example, people tend not to know that Africans first introduced um, citrus for scurvy. The Africans did the first cedarian sections. The Africans showed white physicians how to do inoculations against disease. These things all came from Africans. All, including um, midwifery, was uh, heavily practiced among African-American women and sometimes men. And they did so well relative to the white doctors that many whites as well as blacks would prefer to have, their, have black people treat them. What would happen is that, especially after forceps began being used, black healers had fewer infections they lost fewer children, fewer babies, and people were happier with their care. So white doctors were quite concerned about this. This was direct competition for their services. So they set about denigrating these white, these black women who were rendering excellent care. But what did they say? Did they say that, they, well, they're not treating the patients well, the patients are dying? They couldn't say that because the patients were doing better. So they said that they're uneducated. And um, they also went on... Uh, elsewhere to say that these are like occult, um, non-Christian practices that they're doing. So they denigrate them for basically for being black. Now, the you know, ironic thing is that during this time, many white physicians did not have MDs. It wasn't required. One didn't really expect a physician to have an MD necessarily. Uh, that kind of professionalism came along later, uh, later on. So calling them uneducated was kind of silly because they were not so much better educated themselves. The competition actually grew deadly after a while. Um, oh, I have to point out that they had to allude to the fact that the black women were having better success. So what did they do? They said, oh, a lucky negress, you know? I'm a learned obstetrician, you're a lucky negress, you know? It was pure luck, apparently. But then things got deadly because what happened was the competition grew so bitter, so bitter 
among um, white doctors and black male practitioners especially, that they began killing black doctors. Um, the claim was usually that the black doctor or doctoress, as they were called then, had poisoned the patient or caused the patient's death. But the real reason sometimes was that the doctors simply did not like the competition. Also, there was some discomfort because households, even though doctors and um, scientists would characterize black people as being unintelligent, households in the South were dependent on the expertise of black people. You know, you had black um, cooks who also were nurses and herbalists. So you had, um, they knew that they were putting their lives in people's hands, but the reality was that slave insurrections were so frequent and so bloody that they, were, they didn't really trust the people who, they had, um, who their lives depended on. So when they had a death, when someone died in treatment, sometimes they overreacted. Oh, you know, that slave woman, she must have killed that woman. She wouldn't have died otherwise. And that was often enough to go on in court. You didn't have to present evidence against a slave as you did um, a, white, a free white man. You just had to testify that you did not, you never trusted that person. If that enslaved person could not find enough white people to testify on their behalf that they had a good character, they were likely to be killed. And what's happening today with black healers? First of all, black male healers, their numbers have been plummeting. According to some reports, the peak year for graduating black male doctors was 1974. And how are black women healers? At first glance, they're doing well. When I speak at medical school to spend time there, I find that, you know, women are now the majority in medical schools, and black women, you see them frequently. But how are they treated once they get out into the world? Remember those Delta flights when two black women on separate occasions uh, had responded to a call from the crew for assistance. They had a patient who was very sick, and they said, are there any doctors on board who can help us? The black woman who volunteered was told, sit down, we're looking for real doctors. <laughs> Even when she showed her credentials and insisted, they would not let her help. This. She said the patient was in distress. I wanted to go to him. They blocked my way and would not let me go help him. They f and then a white doctor jumped up and said he was a doctor, did not show his credentials, and he was led to the patient, who fortunately was fine. And then it wasn't, I think maybe a week or two later, the same thing happened to another black woman doctor who um, tried to respond to a distress call and was told, sit down, we're looking for credentialed people. So there's a certain, a certain denial, a tendency for a denial of um, black women's scientific expertise. There also have very recent studies showing that scientists of color who are black women and Hispanic women and First Nations women, 60% of the time they have been mistaken for assistants or secretaries or technicians. So the um, acknowledgement of their expertise can be very hard to come by. These scientists who characterize black people for the nation, American School of Ethnology, um, the most prevalent, famous scientists in the, in the world, frankly, at, during their time, came up with a lot of categories, a lot of, a lot of these categories showing how blacks fell to the bottom on every list, but also they talked about the character and the physiology the physical complements of black people. What were black people like physically? And they found some very disturbing things. The disturbing things they found, they didn't offer any evidence for it. They had no data. But it was a case of the doctors agreeing that everybody knew. It was a case that black people's bodies were inferior. Black people had lower intelligence, and they had childlike judgment. They were not like adults. That their sexuality was dangerous. That not only were black women these um, Jezebels or whores, but black men had a tendency to want to rape white women. They also said that black people all had sexually transmitted diseases. And significant for today, scientists of the, of the era said that black people were not good parents. Black people, black women were indifferent mothers and black men were absent fathers. They cared nothing about their children. And they also had a slew of imaginary diseases that only they had. And um, what were these diseases? They were things like um, drapetomania, hepatitis ethiopica. The names don't mean much to us today, but.
but basically these, all these diseases were things that only black people had, not white people. And um, they were characterized by things like disobeying a white man, hitting one's master, and the more infamous one that someone, I know someone here knows about it, drapetomania. Drapetomania was that disease shown by a slave who ran away. So if you're a slave in ancient Greece or Rome, it's logical to run away, but if you're a black slave in the Americas and you run away, now you have a psychiatric disease with a strong forensic component, so you have these diseases. Also, it was held that black people were all syphilitic, their children died very early because they were such poor parents. Actually, their children died very early because their children were slaves and starved and beaten and worked unmercifully and got no medical attention. But they, it was characterized as a parent's fault. Also, pellagra was called a black disease. Pellagra is a disease um, character that has characterized by roughened skin initially, but later goes on to madness, mental illness, and death. Horrible disease. They said black people got it because they're dirty, and it's an infectious disease because they're, they're never clean. In reality, pellagra is a, is a deficiency disease. People who don't get enough knives and get pellagra. So the fact that black slaves are being routinely starved is what gave them pellagra. So um, the black people also all had malingering. In fact, I found two doctors who wrote their master's thesis on malingering. And malingering is simply pretending to be sick when you're not. Now, what's the importance of malingering? Well, you're saying that black people have all these diseases, right? But you're also saying they malinger, pretend to be sick when they're not. If you have slaves who are refusing to work because they're sick, what better way to force them out of the sick house than have a doctor declare that they're malingering, they're not really sick, they are fit to work, and they're back in the fields, well or not. So there are also immunities against disease that black people had. One of the biggest immunities for our purposes, really important, is that black people did not feel pain. This is because scientists told us they had a very primitive, undeveloped nervous system that didn't register pain. It didn't register anxiety. Black people didn't have heart disease because back then people thought that heart disease was caused by anxiety. Black people did not have mental disorders because they had no real mental acumen. They had no um, nervous system, really, so how could they have a mental disorder? They're happy, right? They're singing and whistling all the time. They didn't get fatigued, and they didn't suffer from heat-related illness because, of course, they're from Africa, so you're not going to get heat stroke. You're not going to die from being overheated. And they didn't get malaria. They didn't die from yellow fever. These are nonsensical. If you look at the um, physician's memoirs of the days, it's filled with records of, of treating slaves with malaria and yellow fever. Why are they saying that black people didn't get them? Because that statement supported enslavement. If you were a planter and you had acres and acres of fertile ground that you stole from the First Nations people and you, want, you need bodies to work that ground in the hot southern sun in a malarious climate, what better gift than someone who didn't get malaria, who didn't suffer from heat stroke, who's not going to get yellow fever, who's not going to feel pain or fatigue. So the slave body was constructed by science to meet the needs of the enslavement system. Keep in mind that many that, that doctors at this period were utterly beholden to, plant, to um, slave owners. You know, physicians today, a very high status profession, right? They, among other things, they, they make a good living if they choose to. But back then, it was, hard, it was a hard scrabble existence. Dr. Sims' father did not want him to be a physician. You're gonna, you're gonna disgrace the family, you know? So it was hard to make a living and they didn't have high status, they had to ingratiate themselves to slave owners. And so espousing these beliefs that fit the needs of slave owners was a logical thing for them to do. And bear in mind that many physicians themselves were slave owners. They sometimes owned slaves in order to have research subjects and sometimes just to, to do the things that other slave owners did with them, have them do all the work in the household, plow the fields, have sex with them because you could not legally rape a black woman. Just like today, you cannot le legally rape a First Nations woman on the reservation. Back then, you could not legally rape a black woman. So these um, black communities were useful, promulgated by scientists to support the enslavement system. And we laugh at them today because they're so laughable. How can you say that black people don't get yellow fever or don't feel pain? But you know what? We do. 
We have black diseases today that we believe in. Sickle cell disease. Most people believe that that's a black disease. If you are white and have sickle cell, people will begin asking you about your black forebears. But the reality is it's not. It's not a racial disease. Disease of people from areas where the Anopheles mosquito is common. Um, sickle cell disease is a horrible disease. But sickle cell trait, when you have only one gene for sickle cell, is actually a beneficial state if you live in an area near the Anopheles mosquito. Because Anopheles mosquitoes transmit malaria. And if you have the sickle cell trait, it gives you protection against malaria. So people in areas where there's a lot of sickle, or a lot of um, Anopheles disease, a lot of malaria, they tend to live longer than people who don't have sickle cell trait. But in this country where we don't have malaria, it's no use to us at all. The thing is that it's only way I can, I can put it is publication bias. If you read the medical journals, they will focus on black people with sickle cell, they'll discuss sickle cells if it's a black disease, but it's, but it's simply not. And um, this is information that is uh, hidden. It's hidden information. People don't realize it. Um, and then there are a lot of other diseases suffered by black people and white people, but characterized as black disorders. Or when black people get them, they're told that, well, it's because you're black. For example, low birth weight babies. When I first went to Harvard as a fellow, we were talking about low birth weight babies, and the head of child maternal mortality told me, we don't know why black women have so many low birth weight babies. It's something innate in them, something inherent in them. I thought, what a thing for a scientist to say. But no one was disagreeing with her. Then crack babies. That's an invention, of course. But it was an invention that characterized only black babies. I was a newspaper editor for about 18 years. I never saw a photo of a white crack baby. If it's caused by, it was not caused by crack use, but if it had been caused by crack use, there would have been more white crack babies than black crack babies. There were more white crack use than, white, than black crack uses. But it was a racialized disease, and it turned out to be an imaginary disease. It doesn't exist, but it was created by the media supported by the um, medical system, and only refuted, what, within the last 10 years? Then skin cancer. Um, only fairly recently have there's been a widespread realization that black people get skin cancer. Certain types of skin cancer, like acrolentigous uh, melanoma, are more common among black people. But for a long time, um, it was considered a disease that only white person got, that blacks are fairly immune to it. I could go on and on and on, but the one other one I want to mention is that having a subnormal IQ, there's a 15-point gap demonstrated between the IQs of black and white people in this country, and it's usually um, characterized by hereditarian scientists as being something innate in black people. There's something that you're born with that makes you have a lower IQ. So many people believe this. Many intelligent scientists believe this. I don't think it's the case. I think you can only arrive at that opinion by completely ignoring the disparate environments in which black and white people live, especially environmental toxicity, which we know has profound effects on the brain, not just lead, but mercury, other heavy metals, hydrocarbons, all kinds of things affect cognition, thinking, the brain very, very heavily. And black people live in a witch's brew, a sea of these toxins. And no one is asking, could this have something to do with this IQ gap? Should it exist? So we have our own immunities fed by the same kind of bias, mythology, among scientists as well as lay people. So remember I mentioned pain. Scientists of the Victorian era all agreed that black people did not feel pain. And we even had these little, clever little quotes from doctors testifying to this belief. Uh, Charles White said, I've taken the legs off many African Americans who held the leg themselves, they're not feeling a thing. Well, you can believe that if you want. The fact is, as much as we find that laughable today, what are we do yesterday, what are we doing today? Today, we still discount claims of pain when made by African Americans. There have been numerous cons studies consistently showing that black people presenting to doctors in pain do not get effective pain medication. They're often dismissed as drug-seeking. And I think that study came out only last year or so. Yeah, 2016. This study um, showed that half of medical students believe that black people did not feel pain as white people did. They believed that black people had different bodies than white people. All these things, all these beliefs promulgated in the 18th century by the school of technology are still with us today. Doctors believe this. It affects how they treat people. And I mentioned that um, 
just as black women were seen as being Jezebels, black men were seen as being rapists, especially dangerous to white women. And we can see this quote by W.T. English. I think it was, uh, it was the 19th century when he made that quote. But we still behave as if we believe that today. I don't know if any of you remember Rushan Williams, who in the mid-1990s was um, very interesting. His picture and his name were splashed across newspapers as being the demon who infected a, a bunch of young girls with HIV. These girls were all white. And I was an editor then, I'm reading the stories, I'm thinking, wait a minute, there are one million unanswered questions in these stories. You're assuming that he infected these girls. These girls are all living a chaotic lifestyle. We don't know if he infected them. We don't know if one of them infected him. But the assumption has been that he did this. At that time, the um, confidentiality and privacy of eight people with HIV was sacred. We were not publishing the names of people in the paper who had HIV, only those who voluntarily gave their names or wrote about their experiences, and yet they had no problem splashing his name across the paper. So it's just an example of how readily people accept this trophy of black men as rapists and men of color in general, because Hispanic men suffer the same sort of um, bias. And the use of the word machismo, for example, in Latino and black men, um, for the same behaviors exhibited by white men, and men in general, but for Hispanic men, it's demonized. It's considered something even worse. It, it takes on a sexually aggressive nature when it comes to Hispanic men. And Asian men are not immune. During the last war is where you saw the most dramatic and egregious um, illustrations of you know, our enemy, the Japanese, as being bloodthirsty rapists. And I mean, these images were everywhere. So this, this plays into another characterization of black men and men of color as being indifferent fathers, absent fathers. Um, so basically, they're, they're sperm donors who don't care about their kids or their wives, etc. But a study done with the Division of Vital Statistics showed that um, even though that in this country we have a lot of absent fathers, one in three fathers is, of any race is absent father, but black men are closer to their children. They're more likely to be the primary, I know many black men who are the primary caregivers of their children, sometimes sole caregivers, and they are present in their, in their children's day-to-day -day life in the way that men of other races are not. And yet this um, bias, this um, myth of black men as being abandoners of their families Chris, you know the abandoner of um, black children, the original one, the one who we'd never castigate? This guy. Many slave owners had children with the women that they owned. And when they, these children were born, they inherited slave status, which by the way, is contrary to English common law. They should have inherited the status of their father and become free, but no, they became slaves. That's more profitable. And so they abandoned their own children to enslavement in huge numbers. But the, I see a lack of outrage around, around that as we see the outrage around the men of color. And black mothers today are still casted as being very poor mothers. Um, posters like this one, and the belief that um, part of the crack baby myth was to denigrate black mothers by saying that they cared more about their drug use and their drugs than their children. Posters like this were put up don't let a pregnancy ruin your drug habit. People offering to pay women, women of color, to have, um, you know, to be sterilized or, or to take on a contraceptive, implanted contraception, get birth control, get cash. So this um, embracement of the image of parents of color as being um, malevolent. And even today, we have women of color being incarcerated just for poor birth outcomes. If your baby is, is born dead, if you have a stillbirth, you might be investigated. This um, Regina McKnight was investigated um, for, drug, for killing her baby by drug use when, she, when her baby was born dead. But she didn't use drugs. 
more to the point, the prosecutor offered no evidence that she used drugs, and she was convicted anyway. That shows how prevalent this myth is. They needed no evidence to convince judge and jury that she indeed was a drug user whose drug use killed her baby. And she's only one among many. When it comes to intelligence, um, I love this quote by Stephen Jay Gould. I use it whenever I can. There has been a lot of uh, investigation, much of it rigged and flawed, into black and people of color intellectual ability, endeavoring to show that it's lower than whites. In the past, we had people filling empty skulls with marbles and shot to measure the volume and then show the volume of a black person's uh, skull was lower than that of a white. And the same for other people of color. It's a nonsensical, of course, but today there are genetic tests that turn out to be dubious or outright, or, or, or outright unscientific that are also focused on showing that African Americans, Latinos, First Nations people all have lower intelligence. Now, one interesting thing is that you'll frequently hear, it's not racial. After all, Asian people have high intelligence. We know that Asian people have a higher IQ than whites. Some Asian people, Asian people from um, relatively affluent countries. Other Asian people fall right into the scale of African Americans with, all, with the same 15-point gap emerging. So Asians are only brought into the conversation in order to denigrate Latinos and African Americans. Here's, here's an example of what I talked about before, the taxonomy, the, the catalogs of showing where people fell on the, um, basically, the, the ladder of humanity. Tied to skull shape in the past, today it's tied to genetics. The genetics are often very, are laughably badly done. So the, with the Asians, the problem is there, but it's more subtle. Because they're often taught as a model minority, with a higher than average IQ. But as you can see on the slide, it's not always higher than average. And more to the point, this higher IQ is a two-edged sword. It's not always a good thing. When it's said of whites, it's always a good thing. But when it's said of Asians, you find that um, calling them, for example, gifted in math and science translates to being devoid of creativity and lacking to personal skills. Polite means inscrutable and submissive. Hardworking, unfair competition for well-rounded, normal people. Family-oriented, clannish, too ethnic. You can see how every positive attribute has its negative um, obverse. And so Asians also, a little bit more subtly, are being castigated by scientific... This is current research substantiating a lot of these beliefs. But they look very much like the bias espoused in the 18th century and the 19th century. In fact, Asians are often held to be too intelligent. Um, there's a Princeton lawsuit brought in 2015 by Asians who complained that Princeton's policies were setting up um, hurdles for Asian students that were higher than those for other students of color, that African Americans and Hispanics were being favored. Now, they lost the lawsuit. But I don't think they were, I think they had some merit there. I think there's, it's very likely that subsequent lawsuits will show this is indeed the case. You're finding that um, people expressing concern, as I heard at Stanford, for example, that there were too many Asians on campus. It's a merit-based system, you know, get over it. So, but it's also an illustration of bias, that despite achievement, you know, these standards of achievement that were set by whites themselves, when Asians exceed them, they're being castigated for it sometimes and punished for it. I mentioned the fact that um, poor people of color in particular, but all people of color are more likely to be exposed to these pathogens, these um, brain eroding um, pathogens and um, toxins. But that's left out of discussions around intelligence. And now I want to go to something else a little bit different. Today, what are the contemporary research issues in this country we should worry about? I would say that aside from the persistence of these mythologies that cause us to treat people of color differently in the medical arena, we have other things to worry about. And these include um, what I call the erosion of informed consent. How many here think that if you are engaged in medical research, um, you have to have informed consent? 
someone's got to get your permission after telling you a lot of information about the study and giving you a chance to make a choice. Who believes that? You don't believe in informed consent? You don't think that's happening? <laughs> well, people who don't think it's happening are, are wrong. It is happening, but it's also being eroded. It's also being worn down. And there are also cases where it's not happening. So if you belong to a group of people, trauma victims, a huge group of people, by the way, um, if you are a trauma victim, hit by a car, shot in the chest, then you can, people can do research on you without asking your permission, without even telling you, without telling your family. This has been done in at least 20 studies I identified to date. The law was changed in 1996, the Code of Federal Regulations, was changed to allow involuntary research with trauma victims. And the rationale is completely absurd. I asked some other ethicists, how can you justify this? Why, why do you support this? And the response I got most often was, oh, it's used very rarely. That's not an ethical defense. If I murder somebody, I can't say, but I so rarely murder anyone. You know, it's wrong. <laughs> And um, the rationale given in the law is that these people are unconscious. They can't give their consent. So that's completely absurd. You know, Nuremberg Code, which is not legally binding, but is a model for our ethical laws, the Nuremberg Code says you have to get the voluntary consent of a subject. But we in the U U.S. have decided, no, you don't, because research demands it. If you want to do research, and then voluntary consent is standing in the way, then you can get it out of the way using this rule. But if you're doing research in the developing world, you don't even have to do that. It's a lot simpler. All you have to do is lie. If, because we rely on the word of researchers in the developing world that they have given informed consent. If they say they've done it, we say, oh, okay. No one double checks, no, there's no oversight. And in many cases, it has become quite clear to anybody who's investigating it that there has been no informed consent. The most infamous case uh, happened recently was in Kano, Nigeria, where Pfizer tested a new drug for meningitis in the middle of a meningitis epidemic. They set up a tent next to Doctors Without Borders. People who lived in the area didn't know that at one tent you had the selfless doctors of Doctors Without Borders working to help save their children. The next tent you had Pfizer doctors who were there as researchers testing a new unt untried um, modality that caused deafness and killed some of these children. So informed consent is something that we are slowly losing our grip on and it's a big, big problem for all of us. My fear is that when it is completely gone or more broadly gone, it's going to be too late and the American people will not know about it in time. There's also problems with reproductive technology. In fact, genetic technology in general, but I'll focus on, let me focus on one aspect. One of the problems with reproductive technology is that it has no ethics itself. You can have the same technology and use it for good or use it for bad. You can use it for healing or you can use it to harm people. You can use it to remove bias or you can use it to reinforce it. That's exactly what's happening. When we read newspaper articles or see um, uh, TV shows about men who have been exonerated from prison by uh, genetic technology, that's wonderful, right? It gives, it's heartening. It makes you, um, it gives you a sense that these technologies are liberating people, are creating justice. It's a wonderful thing. The exact same technologies that, though have been used to um, unfairly stigmatize more men of color than they will ever exonerate. And let's be clear, we're talking mostly about men of color here. White men have been exonerated too, but it's mostly black men. Mostly black men, as a matter of fact, who have been convicted of assaulting white women who are exonerated by these technologies. So the genetic technologies, um, one example is a DNA screen uh, sweep. If you have a DNA sweep, basically you have a crime, you have biological material left behind by the um, assailant, and you're testing material to try to find out who did this, right? That sounds fine. The problem is how you test it. What's being done are frankly racial DNA sweeps where for one reason or another, the lawmakers have decided we're looking for a black suspect. 
or Latino suspect. We're looking for a man of color. Okay, now what is done is you go to a community where the assault took place and you convince, you convince men of color to give up their DNA. It's very coercive the way this is done. The men are often threatened. Either you give us your DNA now on the spot or we'll take you to jail. They are, they are, they are approached in their workplaces and told, listen, give us a sample, we'll go away, don't make us get, let your boss get involved and tell him what's going on, that, you're, that there's a murder uh, or a rape crime and we're looking at you. Just quietly give us your sample. In this manner, they've gotten the sample of many, many men of color, and now they have a database of criminals. 7,000 such um, samples were taken in one study in the US. You know how many crimes they found with it? One. And the one sample that turned out to be a crime came from a man who had offered his own DNA. So all these coerced men were innocent, but now their genetic material resides in a database. Next time they're looking for a criminal, they're going to go to that database. It's a you know, collective presumption of guilt for these men of color. And that's what's happening with the same technology used to exonerate men from prison. That is our big concern today. We have all this genetic technology, and the ethics have not caught up with it. We have not considered how we're going to use it, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. In fact, don't even, don't even go to the law arena. Look what happened with 23 and Me, Me recently. Um, they actually found a murder suspect based on someone's attempt to find their genealogy. Because they can look at your DNA, your sample, and get information about people related to you your children, your parents, your siblings, and maybe even other people. So um, when I tell people uh, that I would not have my um, give up a sample for these kind of pro programs because we don't know what use this technology can be made of in the future. You know, also it gives information about other people. If I had a risk of Huntington's, I'm only, not only giving a sample that talks about me, but can find out my kids have it or my parents had it, you know? And also, um, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, potholes in, the in this road, and we're not looking at the science. We're not looking at what could possibly happen. We're just seizing on technology and using it. A similar situation exists with disabilities. Technology is infecting the way that we look at disabilities and what we do about it. The interesting thing is, I remember when I took my first human genetics course in the 70s, the discussion around Down syndrome was simply that most people were told, institutionalize your child, you know? Put them someplace where they can care for them appropriately. There's like, not with any consideration that maybe you could take the child and raise them yourself. But, and a lot of um, discourse in national magazines about the uh, Sturm and Drang, all the trials and travails of raising a child with Down syndrome, how hard it is. It gave people a very negative view of them, a challenging medical state, of course, but the ease with which people talked about institutionalization quickly gave over to an ease of talking about euthanasia. That's a misnomer in my opinion. Euthanasia means good death. And killing a child because uh, he's differently abled is not a good death in my opinion. But um, so today, we have not gotten away from that. Today we have ethicists like Peter Singer. Um, he gave an example of a, of a down baby, baby with downs, as a baby who should be killed. He doesn't think that, you know, why keep a person like that alive? They're not fully human. They'll never be fully human. His definition of fully human has to do with intellectual capacity. And um, he ought to go back to genetics text because intellectual capacity is not always um, <laughs> affected heavily with Down syndrome children. But the idea is that the technology is making it easier and easier to make decisions um, that are poor decisions about the fate of people with disabilities. Um, I can only think about when I read about Singer's claim about in Berlin, in Tiergartenstrasse, um, during, the, during World War II, and um, even before World War II, physicians were killing infants, you know, uh, useless eaters. Uh, they'll never be productive members of society, so we need to dispense with them. And um, this mentality of um, judging people by what they can and can't do by um, standards that are by no means humane or accepted standards, and then taking the draconian step of killing people, uh, people who already have been uh, robbed of most rights 
it's very, very, it's very frightening to see the alacrity with which people discuss this. You know, today you hear this discussed like it's just another ethical problem instead of the outrage that it is. And also, um, I did a paper on boys with XYY syndrome. For a long time, people thought that these boys had double the risk of ending up um, in prison as a violent offender. In Scandinavia, most boys with this anomaly were aborted. But today we know these boys are normal. There's nothing wrong with them. And um, the fact is, all these children were killed because of their quote unquote disability. It turned out not to be a disability. We didn't understand the genetics then. So we have to be very, very careful that we um, don't use technology as we've used scientific um, uh, theories to simply buttress our biases and our fears, but rather we actually use the data and use um, principles of humanity to determine how we treat people in the medical sphere and outside it. Thank you so much for listening to me. I wonder if uh, you could take a little time and just ask a few questions from the audience. And uh, <clears throat> I get to start. So um, as a physician, I realized that y you know, multiple generations of kind of the abuse of people of color by the medical system has led to this deep mistrust well-founded deep mistrust of physicians in the United States that persists to this day from people of color. I wonder if you have any advice to providers about the things that we might do, the most important things we could do to help bridge the divide and, and really become effective uh, healthcare practitioners for people of color. My first advice is to abandon that question for another one. Okay. And the other question is, why is the American healthcare system so untrustworthy? What can we do to make it more trustworthy? Because when we do, people will then gladly participate. You won't have to sell studies to them. They'll throng to be in studies once they can trust them. And you know, um, that's the problem. The system is not trustworthy. So of course, people are not going to trust it. Interestingly, though, although African Americans do distrust the system at higher rates, white people do not trust it terribly well either. I mean, the numbers are all over the place, but I read one study that um, was fairly credible, and it said that 51% of whites expressed distrust for the system, and 83% of African Americans. 51% of whites, that is not a resounding um, <laughs> endorsement. So it's a problem that is um, more acute among African Americans, but it's certainly prevalent throughout our whole country. And we have to fix the system. And um, that's difficult, but it can be done. Thank you. Okay. Questions from others? Right here. So, so I work at an organization that works on policy and advocacy, and um, I recently read a piece that came out in the New York Times for substance-exposed newborns, and I just wondered how we could address what you just shared with us, but also uh, speak to the policy that needs to, uh, that, that we need to think of to address that issue without demonizing either of the groups, um, but just doing what's best for everybody and how we address that. Substance abuse infants. Well, substance abuse infants certainly um, are a group that need care, and we need to eradicate that group. But the thing about the cracked baby is it was found that these babies were um, victims of the same conditions as other people living in poverty. Poverty was found to be the cause of their problems. And so substance abuse is the cause of their problems. And so I think that addressing that will obviously address, you know, help these babies. You know, you, again, you go to the root of the problem to cure, if you want to cure it. The band-aids have not been working very well. Here. Maggie, sorry. Okay. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your talk and for your work. Um, I have two questions. Uh, first, um, as, as a religious ethicist, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the ways that folks' ethics change according to the conditions 
that that they come from. And so um, I'm very interested to know, in addition to kind of a reluctance to seek medical care, what other sorts of moral transformation takes place in the lives of people of color, African Americans in particular, as a result of um, the kinds of dis disparities that you demonstrated. Second question is a curiosity about whether or not you found any evidence of slave plantations that were particularly uh, focused on um, on breeding and on the work of breeding and uh, and and where you found those studies and uh, what what sorts of findings you, you might have recovered there I didn't look at breeding but other people have so I'm sure you can find something um, in terms of moral changes among African Americans I think that um one of the things that happened is that it reinforced their faith in their own healthcare systems, which people tend to forget Africans brought their own healthcare systems with them. And they contrasted American systems, which looked at people bodies as mechanistic, um, treated people like animals, basically. Their systems encompass spirituality and psychology. So healing the community, healing relationships was part of healing the body. And I think there's a greater focus on that, on these communities, as a result of the uh, what, they, what was done to them by the Western healers. Hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work and your research. Um, I won't go into details, but one of my grand, I have, you know, we all have two grandfathers. Well, one of my grandfathers. Uh, died a tragic death at Central State Hospital in Virginia. If you, and I don't know if you've done any research specifically about that hospital. I'll talk to you about it after um, this. So um, I just think it's important that um, you talked about health, but there were also mental health institutions that did experimentation on African Americans. And my grandfather was there for a total of four days with a very high temperature. He didn't make it. But uh, there, the systems um, that put him there were very interesting. Um, everything from having um, the, count, the white county uh, policeman, I don't think they called him a policeman back then, but um, institutionalize a sick man to a mental health institution and he didn't get the treatment he needed and died within four days. But they did a lot of experimentation so much so that um, they asked me if my grandfather had syphilis because obviously they sent quite a few people there as well. Right. Yeah, a great deal could be said about the mental health institutions. Um, I didn't get to it, but yes, that problem. When did your grandfather die? He died in 19, I think 1949. Really sorry to hear that. But you're right, it was common, very common. I can use my preacher voice. But the, uh, the question that I have, uh, if you've done research on the correlation of neighborhoods and people of color and where the geography is located in terms of landfills and all of that, and that's a poverty indicator as well, um, how is that in access to health care even in those instances where it's intentionally placed neighborhoods to, in which to live? That's a very good question. I don't have time to answer it. <laughs> But you can find the answer in my forthcoming book, which focuses on environmental racism and cognitive consequences and thinking problems. And um, what I found, I found several interesting things. The risks that are usually characterized as being socioeconomic, you know, economic in nature, yes, being poor puts you at higher risk of exposure to environmental toxicity, but being a person of color puts you at even much higher risk. So race is actually the number one factor, with economics coming behind it. Uh, the shorthand is that at, uh, white people with an income of $10,000 a year are, suffer, are subjected to less environmental toxicity than black people with an income of $60,000 a year. So clearly it's race. It's, even though most of the um, popular writing focuses on economics, it's actually a racial issue. And it's intentional, but it's intentional, how can I put it? It's not intentional in the way someone holding a gun to your head is intentional. It's intentional the way a concrete wall over an expressway is intentional. They'll both kill you. 
but one is a little, looks a little more passive, you know, easier to remove the actor. So you can't point to a person who, well, you can sometimes, but you can't always point to a person who said, let's put the poisons in the black neighborhood. But you can point to policies that evolved with exactly that foreseeable result over time, a consistent result. Over time in the same areas, time after time, it would happen, so it's not an accident either. It's a matter of a design, a system that is designed to um, protect certain people from exposure and to make sure that people who are exposed are people who are dispensable people. You know, I see uh, a few colleagues from our medical school um, and our health science university and campus in the audience, and um, your comment about the decrease in the number of graduating black physicians, black male physicians, black physicians overall, which is paralleled by a decrease in the number of Latino physicians, uh, and Colorado, I'm, I'm yes, Sorry, you okay? Yeah. Um, physicians as well, a and we have you know, some some uh, well-dedicated programs, but usually at the top end of the, mm -hmm. of the, at the at the medical school for improving recruitment and diversifying the medical school class. I wonder if, as you thought about it in this decrease, and, and I would say the imperative to reverse that, are there other things that we might do at a state level or that are within our control to really try to have the medical workforce, including the nursing workforce, physical therapist workforce, um, uh, psychologist workforce. I don't want to leave anybody out. Uh, better dental, thank you. Oh, I, I knew I would, thank you, Chancellor. Um, to reflect the populations that we're trying to serve. I think that when, sorry, keeping people, keeping people in the pipeline to a medical career is important. And a lot of, look where people are being lost. I don't know, I haven't studied this. If you, I had to guess, I would guess that people are being lost in undergraduate years. Because that's where I was told that despite my high IP scores and my demonstration in science that I shouldn't be a doctor because it's an unrealistic goal. There are no black women doctors. Yes, I was actually told that, you know. Um, I think there's a lot of um, dissuasion that happens during that time and people, need more support there, especially when you're talking about people who sometimes don't have a long tradition of educational attainment. I mean, they don't have like generations before them. Uh, my husband, for example, was the first person in his you know, family to go to university. So um, retention at the undergraduate level and support there is what's really, really needed. Um, and I think that we'd see a, a difference if we, if we did that. Great. Dr. Green. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, I'm uh, guilty of being one of those uh, colleagues of Ned out at the uh, Andrews campus. And uh, I'd like to ask you, to your level of comfort, uh, if you would might, might not mind being just a little more personal in your own thinking. Uh, this breadth of scholarly research and what it exposes that you have command of, I just know that this has led you to conclude that there are some underlying principles or underlying guideposts that could be used by all of us uh, to guide our choices, our behaviors, our decisions going forward. Do, do you have sort of a set of principles that you think that could be a basis of uniting us to saying we're together on pursuing these principles? I don't have a coherent philosophy of the one that you know you suggested, but I do know I do think there are things that we all could benefit by and we all should do. Unfortunately, a lot of them are not within our individual control. So 
what I'd like to see happen, there are things that could happen that I, I'm sure would benefit everybody. And um, in terms of individual philosophy, I would say the golden rule would do it. I mean, do unto others as you would have them do it unto you. It's really that simple. For me, that's medical ethics. <laughs> but in terms of things that should change and allow um, professionals and people to uh, do the best job of caring for others, um, I was explaining that there are laws in this country that invalidate informed consent. We need to repeal those. There are laws in this country that have give, given commercial um, corporations control over medical research. We need to repeal those laws. They were passed, most of them passed in one year, 1980, including the Bay Dole Act. It should be repealed. And we need to eliminate health care lobbyists from Congress because health, lobbyists have no place in health care. They are convincing our lawmakers to pass laws that benefit their corporations and harm us. That harms all of us. If we did those three things, we'd see a transformed medical universe in this country. So thanks for your excellent question. I, I basically have maybe a comment, and thank you so much for, your <clears throat> for coming. My observation is I'm a care manager, and what I'm observing is I work with a lot of families that are low income, and they, are, they have Medicaid. And I have seen a lot of disparities because of the lack of insurance that some of my um, clients have, and they're not getting, either they're ignored, pain, um, strokes, they have had many strokes and no one's listening to them. Um, women don't get heart disease, um, things of that nature, and these are all people that I'm speaking of that are all Medicaid recipients. And I'm watching their health deteriorate because we're constantly trying to advocate for them so that they can get their needs met. So I think my biggest question or my concern is, is we have a lot of doctors that do care, but we also have a lot of doctors that do not like to take Medicaid. So, and that's their own, their own choice. Um, but what I'm finding is we're having a lot of patients that do not have care because they're on wait lists or they can't get into the Denver health or university hospital and then every, the, 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 the Medicaid prices are going up because they're going to the emergency room or they're going to urgent care because they're not able to get their needs met through a primary care physician. So that's one of the things that is really concerning to me and um, I'm not quite sure how you could answer that or if you're, what your thoughts are on it, but that's just one of my concerns. Very, very important point and I wish I had the answer. But the reality is that Medicare has instituted medical apartheid in this country because we have a system, a government system devoted to lowering the standard of care for poor people. You know, it's not, I mean, if you're going to offer people care, offer them care, but Medicaid is, is giving disincentives to caring for people. And doctors not accepting them, that may sound, sound terrible, but frankly, I sympathize. I mean, the rates are so low that it costs doctors money to treat patients. And there are a slew of other problems. The doctor's hands are actually tied, often from giving what they think is best care, because Medicaid won't cover it. So it's a huge problem. We, again, it's one that a lot of these problems have roots in the law. We need to, Medicaid is a legal system. We need to change the law around Medicaid. And instead of giving um, people a lower tier of care, give them the same care as everyone else. Now, that is expensive. That means we may have to slash dollars elsewhere, but we have to at least start looking for ways to afford to do that. So, you know, your point is a really good one. I'm glad you made it. Right back in the back. Hi, um, thank you so much. This was such an awesome presentation. Um, I love all your research and so grateful that you brought us it to us tonight. Um, I think you just draw, drew a straight line between your research and your reflection of um, the past and um, individuals nowadays saying things like people coming over the borders are rapists, they're animals, um, dehumanizing, um, in effect, uh, uh, current uh, political situations. Um, so my question for you is, what is a medical ethicist to do in this period of uh, fake news and alternative facts? What, how can we um, thread the needle between using science for good 
and science for evil? Great question. Again, if I had the answer to that, <laughs> I'd be elsewhere. But I have a really good idea of where to start, and that is that ethicists should not take money from commercial medical organizations. Don't take money from big pharma. And the problem I see is that many ethicists, including at one time myself, thought they could take money from large corporations and, and big pharma because I know that I'm looking, I'm doing God's work, you know, I know I'm looking for the truth. I can't be bought for a couple thousand dollars, right? Um, and that attitude gets you in trouble because what I didn't realize at the time was that I accepted an invitation from a group, um, a farmer group to speak to their group and I spoke I asked them to donate my fee to someone. They wouldn't do it, so I took the fee and donated myself. I took the money. And I thought, no harm done. I said exactly what I would have said to anybody else. You know, I didn't change my message at all. In fact, when I finished, the guy was not too happy with me. I think he assumed that I would. And, um, but then I realized the real danger is that when you've done something like that, they will cherry pick what you have said to find something. So if I rant and rave for an hour about you know, horrible corporations, but I say, but on the other hand, it's good that um, Pfizer gave this and that. That's all they're going to use. So also, people are, can be insidiously bought. You know, today it's a speaking engagement. Tomorrow you sit on a panel. Pfizer now has ethics panels to advise it. You cannot convince me they're listening to them because they care about doing the right thing. They're listening to them because these ethics panels are rubber stamping what they're doing. So anyway, that's one very definite, specific thing that ethicists can do. Stop taking money from corporations. You know, say what you believe, no matter what it is. If you support corporations, say that, but don't take their money. It's a big problem because they will, you, you are going to be used. Uh, you may think that you're above that, but you're going to be used by them, and you're going to muddy the waters for people who begin to think that maybe a certain act is not so bad if this wonderful ethicist has just, you know, quote unquote endorsed it. Way over here. Uh, thank you much, um, Professor Washington, for your time tonight. Um, as a grandson of a foreman of, of a lettuce picking crew in the San Luis Valley and a Latino man myself, I really thank you for your insight. Um, I do work in academia and have for over 18 years, um, taught in university for over 12 years. And currently, I work with one of the most diverse student bodies in my absolute entire career. And it's inspiring, and it's also humbling. What my question is, is how we might bridge the gap between education and healthcare. Because a lot of my students actually do have health issues that get in the way of them obtaining their education and moving forward and realizing the social ability that they're working so very hard to harness, to create a better future for themselves? That's a good question. I'm not an educator, so I don't really feel equipped to address it well. Um, but I think that depending on the type of, of medical challenge, some people find it easier to gain um, accommodations and, you know, meaningful sympathy. I don't mean just like, you know, tea and sympathy, but meaningful sympathy, and other people don't. Some types of disabilities um, are not respected and are not considered um, as they should be in people's educational status. So that needs to change, and probably academics like you will be the ones charged with doing it since you're an insider and um, have a better knowledge of the system than I can hope to have. So keep up the good work. Right here. Hi. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, you hinted earlier about um, poverty being at the root cause of substance uh, abuse for children and babies, and I think that um, can be said for a lot of things within the healthcare system, that so much of what happens in our health isn't just in the direct services that happens in the doctor's office, but often what happens um, outside in the world and a bigger view of health equity. And what I said was that Poverty was the root right. of the disabilities rather than being a crack baby or, you know, the way it had been labeled. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, I feel like in medical practice and providers, 
um, at least in my experience as being someone who is LGBTQ, that they are often not being educated on a holistic view of what that looks like and how um, certain identities, whether it be gender, um, sexual orientation, or race, impact your health. And I'm wondering if there are steps being made in um, medical schooling that is addressing that issue and making sure that doctors have a more holistic view of what it means to treat um, different people based on how they're impacted by poverty, um, racial lines, sexual orientation, and things of that nature. And then the second question I had um, was you talked about changing laws, that there are a lot of laws that impact the way that the healthcare system works, impacts the way that doctors are able to um, give care. And I'm wondering if there's a way or if you have insight on any sort of political apathy, apathy within um, the medical industry and what we can do. I think there are a lot of uh, advocates here who would love some guidance on how we can connect with providers to make sure that they are becoming advocates for their patients and to be more progressive in the way that we uh, are looking at healthcare. In terms of your first question, it wasn't that long ago that we had a candidate for Surgeon General who had written some very wrong and inflammatory and biased papers about homosexuality. They had been given credence in the medical literature and um, at the same time, um, gay women, lesbians, have some of the worst health profiles in the country. And studies show repeatedly that they're treated with disdain by their doctors very frequently. So, you know, how can you exhort people to get health care when they're, they're in danger of being, you know, insulted or having their concerns ignored by their doctors? When you have people, high profile people, who do not represent all doctors, but are high profile, you know, casting aspersions on people um, because of their sexual orientation, saying that it's unnatural, you know. Again, the implication is you're causing your own problems, you know. If you weren't behaving in this way, you wouldn't be sick. No, you're sick because of the way the treat system is treating you. So this is like a prevailing attitude that has got to be confronted head on. Some medical schools are doing it. When I was at the University of Chicago to talk, um, um, Dr. Garcia, who was the head of the Division of Medicine then, had added a whole month to the curriculum before people even began their medical school courses where he brought in people like me, uh, a doctor who was gay and treated, had a gay clientele, um, other doctors who were treating people who had been traditionally maltreated by the system. And I love the fact he did that right at the beginning because these students are going to go into their training inoculated against some of these biases. They've already met people and they know these problems exist. They know that there are people who are treated wrong and they're going to recognize it during their training. More medical schools should do things like that. You know, it's got to be, you can't just wait. You can't invite one or two people and hope things will change. And you can't wait for society to change. You have to um, be ahead of the game and actually craft something in your curriculum and in your faculty that will show students that all people are, going, are to be respected and treated equally. If you don't show them that as part of the training, then you can't expect them to adopt it at some point because someone points it out to them. That's my opinion. I wonder, <clears throat> as a follow-up, you know, it's been more than a decade since the research showed that physicians carry uh, unconscious bias with them into the exam rooms and offer patients different therapies on the basis of how the patient looks, primarily people of color, based on their own feelings about what will be acceptable to the patient. Uh, I asked the question in that, do you think, do you, have you seen any evidence or any suggestion that all of our work that we've tried in terms of cultural competency, training, and other issues in today's medical schools has made that any better? I'm sure it's better. I'm sure it's better, and the question is, is it good enough? Yeah. You know? And no, we know that it's not. Um, medicine is like any other organization in that there's a trickle-down aspect. If someone at the helm, the person running the show, has made it clear that this is um, a priority of his or hers, then others will make it their priority. And I think that's what has to happen. That's what I saw at the University of Chicago, and I'm sure that would work other places, too. 
Um, so I think that's, I hope that that's what, what will happen more. And you know, implicit bias is one thing, but let's not forget we're talking about all kinds of bias, including overt bias, you know? And the fact is overt bias is a little more resistant to logic and treatment. And it doesn't really, in my opinion, I could be wrong, it doesn't really characterize most people. The people I focus on are most concerned about are the people who don't, may not understand that they're biased, you know? But we also have the others out there. And you also have, um, leadership is also shown not only at the top, but also in training. I had a friend who, um, I, I say from the beginning, she reacted very poorly. I understand why she reacted, but I, she, it was poor reaction. She, I won't say where she's training, but she was in a uh, surgical residency, walked into a room, and a patient announced that he was not going to be treated by a nigger doctor. And her response was, lie there and die then. And part of me applauded that, but at the same time, I had to point out to her, <laughs> that's not likely <laughs> to help the situation, right? <laughs> but my big concern was that her attending did not support her. She should not have said that, but she should not have had to say that. He should have been the one to say, you cannot talk to her that way. She's a physician. She's here to treat you, you know, and he didn't. You know, she ended up getting in trouble, but I felt like he was the one who was responsible, too. So we need to see more of that, too. The message needs to go out when you're training people, support them when they're exposed to that kind of bias. Thank you. Well, I, I'm, a, I'm amazed at, uh, at how our your audience has stayed uh, really quite late in, into you. the evening, and I think it's a testament to um, how much uh, learning we've done this evening and how much we appreciate what you've brought to share. I think we probably ought to close now, and uh, I want to point out that Harriet is going to sign books in the atrium afterwards, but at this point, I wonder if we could recognize what she's meant to us this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I do have just a few things. We will post slides from the presentation. Uh, please fill out the survey. We really do read them. And I just have a few thanks. These events are truly a team effort. I want to thank all of the Colorado Trust staff for their assistance, especially our event coordinator, Maggie Frazier, who was so key to most of the things we've done this evening. I want to thank the staff at Colorado, the History Colorado Center, and I want to thank our friends at Open Media Foundation. Uh, who do such a great job of producing the videos. And I hope to see you all for our next event. Thanks so much for coming.